Okay, my name is Susan, Susan Kornfeld, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this Distant Plant, plant Clinic. We have a terrific panel of master gardeners here to help today. Some of you might have met us there at the Arboretum under that beautiful rose arbor, and some of you might be new to us. The main part of our Master Gardener Charter is to help home gardeners with science-based information, and that is what we'll try to do today. And I hope that in the near future, we can all meet again at the beautiful arbor at the San Mateo Arboretum. Now I'd like to introduce our excellent panel, starting with me. I'm something of a generalist. I work as a professional gardener, doing things you gardeners do, planting, weeding, pruning. I write occasional gardening articles and host a Master Gardener work, work book club. And now I'd like to introduce Cindy Bergdorf. She's been a, a gold star master gardener for uh, quite a few years now. She's from Atherton and has an extensive, uh, been gardening extensively all of her life. Well, most of her life. She uh, conducts workshops on habitat and pollinator gardens. So Cindy, welcome. Oops. I've been gardening since I was about eight years old in my grandmother's garden, started with cherry tomatoes. So uh, tomato gardening is one of the classes that I teach. I also teach uh, classes on wildlife habitats. And um, I've been a master gardener since 2008. And I'd like to introduce to you Cindy Morris. Uh, one of her specialties is herbs. She does lots of herb gardening, teaches lots of classes on herbs and gardening. and um, she also is a longtime uh, master gardener. Cindy? Hi. Um, yes, I've been a master gardener since 2010. And um, in all those years, I've learned quite a few things. Um, I love herbs. That's my first passion. Um, I like propagation. Um, I've also been a, um interior plantscaper, so I love indoor plants and designing them. And I just generally just love everything about gardening. Um, our next person is Cynthia Nation, and she is a real succulent lady. Uh, <laughs> if you have a succulent question, she's the person to ask. Cynthia. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Um, yes, I've been a master gardener since um, uh, 2015. It seems like the years have gone by very quickly since I retired, and I uh, came here and and was very very interested in master gardeners so I took all the classes and um, uh, became very interested in succulents um, mostly because of drought tolerant um, drought tolerance and uh, now I grow a lot of vegetables uh, in El Granada in Half Moon Bay area and I would like to introduce Jonathan Prop who is really an expert at growing vegetables I've he teaches so many um, organic fruit and vegetable uh, gardening. He has so many tips. He's also um, a very, very good uh, climate, microclimate and, and weather expert. Uh, and we all need to know about the weather as we're gardening. Jonathan? Jonathan? <laughs> and hit the old mute button. Um, thank you, Cynthia. Um, I've been a master gardener since 2008. As Cynthia said, I, I teach a lot of the classes on uh, fruit and vegetable gardening in the home. Um, also teach a lot about weather and, and microclimates as well. I'm in um, Menlo Park, South San Mateo County, so sort of in the banana belt. Um, so I can address more the, the warmer weather uh, aspects of, of our area. Um, like to introduce Betsy Shelton. Betsy and I were uh, in the same Master Gardener class 2008. Um, and Betsy is, is a real expert in commercial landscaping um, and also very knowledgeable about wisteria. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I, as Jonathan mentioned, I was in the Master Gardener class of 2008 and have loved all the wonderful 
gardening things I've learned since becoming a master gardener. I live in a condominium complex. So I don't have my own garden, but I am the landscaping liaison for my condominium complex, which is why I have learned a great deal about commercial landscaping in the last several years. Um, and I am very fond of wisteria. I spent a lot of time uh, volunteering at Filoli and um, I've learned a lot about wisteria by studying the wisteria at Filoli. So now I will hand it back to, to Susan. Great, thank you everyone and welcome. And I guess now we can turn to our questions. Um, we did have a couple of questions submitted, a few questions submitted in advance, but perhaps many of you have come today with your own questions. And as mentioned in a previous slide, you can put those in the chat box at any time and we'll be getting to them. But I wanna start with uh, Karen's question here on her roses. She said, my rose leaves look like these and worse. You'll see a picture. Some of the plants have what looks like tiny spider webs, but I don't see any spiders or bugs. I've removed effective leaves and sprayed with neem oil, but the problem persists. So let's see one of those pictures. Okay, so you can see in the upper left quadrant, there's some webbing there. And as Karen had suspected, these would be spiders, but they're not true spiders, they're spider mites. And those are little sucking insects. And when you have a bad infestation of them, their tiny little webs become these bigger uh, interconnected webs. So that she's got a little problem there with the spider mites. Now spider mites thrive in a dry and warm um, and dusty environment. And what with the ash and the heat, the end of summer, this is the time when we would expect to see a lot of spider mites. And if we could see the next slide. You see the little stippling there. That's typical of, of the sucking insect damage, and that could very well be due to the um, spider mites. Now, Karen wondered if that might be ash, and if she should, in fact, take her hose and wash off the ash. Um, if you could just scratch that off with your fingernail and it came off, I would say it's ash. It looks like uh, mite damage to me. Uh, and I wouldn't worry, in, in fact, at all about hosing them off because, in fact, one of the ways to treat mites or, or a lot of these little sucking in, um, insects is to take a jet of water and hose them off. They like the dry and, um, and environment, the dry air and the heat and the dust. So keeping it more humid is a good thing. And Karen was worried that hosing it down would damage the roses because we're all taught not to get our roses wet with overhead water. But do it first thing in the morning and then this dry weather uh, they should be fine. And if we could have the uh, other slide. Karen submitted this picture as well. And I wanted to, to point out the coloration of these leaves. There's some sort of purple, reddish, brownish coloration. And if you look at the very tips of the leaves, there's some browning there. Um, that's indicative also of the heat and the drought stress. So I would say these roses probably could use a little more water than they're getting, or at least at that time when this was happening. You can also see the little patches of white. Uh, now I can't see these particular patches, but sometimes you can get a common rose disease called powdery mildew, which affects other plants as well. And it can make, it can look like these little patches as well. Uh, and one way to treat powdery mildew is again, by giving it a more moist environment. That sounds counterintuitive, but for powdery mildew, uh, it works. Powdery mildew thrives in dry. And so again, get a little more humid environment, a little less dusty, and perhaps a little more uh, water. So that's my thoughts on these. Would the panelists have any other comments on this? No, I think you're right on. <laughs> oh, I, did, I don't know if I said it clearly enough, but to, to manage those mites, give a, spray, a real jet of water to the underside in particular of the leaves. And that works whether you have white flies or any of these other little sucking insects, a jet of water. That should get it down to a manageable amount. There are beneficial insects that love spider mites. And if you don't put insecticide or something on there, those beneficial insects will finish the job for you. Okay, thank you. And um, I think we had another question. Okay, so this one just came in. 
And uh, Julie had a, a longer question, but I shortened it for this purposes. Let's see. I'll read her longer one. Julie said she had overhauled her garden in March and April, beginning of COVID, and she had um, removed contaminated sandy soil and purchased a lot of organic garden soil. Uh, and she recently had the soil tested. And um, there she goes. The results were alarming and extremely disheartening. It reported 63 parts per, per oh gosh, ppm, the reader, of extractable lead according to an M3 test. I've since corrected the soil, but wonder what would panelists do and what are good resources? So panelists, what do you think? Um, I did a little research and I found an article from the University of Massachusetts Ag Department uh, about how to um, assess a lead test like this. And it recommend, it, first of all, it says that um, all soil contains lead uh, in usually in parts between 15 to 40 uh, parts per million. And <clears throat> so that would be completely normal. Also, um, if you have an old house that might have been uh, painted with lead paint, or if you live near a highway, say you live close to 101 or El Camino or another busy street, you're going to get lead from gasoline and things like that, which tend to stay in the soil for many, many, many years. So it's very hard to get rid of. But the University of Massachusetts uh, does what they call a SORB, S-O-R-B test uh, for sorbed lead. And <clears throat> then and under that particular test, it looks at lead and other um, poisonous um, uh, chemicals that might be in the soil. And if you have under that particular test, if you have under 400 parts per million, then they have a list of gardening um, uh, techniques and things that they recommend that you do. And you can find this, on, they have a, um, a question and answer sheet. And I found it at ag.umass.edu um, uh, under lead tests. Also, um, um, they will actually do a sorbed lead test. I didn't follow uh, the, the link to see um, if they charge for that or what kind of information you have to provide. But it, it does say that there's a number of things that you can do um, to keep it, it, to, it, to find out if it's under 400 uh, parts per million, then you can do a number of things that make your make it um, more safe um, to garden in those areas. Then it also says that if it's at levels higher than that, uh, at each different level, uh, there will be other increasingly um, stringent things that you would do in your garden uh, to protect yourself. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I just want to add to what. Cindy said, um, I'll, I'll let you in on a little master gardener dirty secret. And that is if we don't know the answer, we, we just look up to see whether there's any University of California research on this. Um, so I just did a little looking around and um, I found an, an article uh, called Home Gardens and Lead, what you should know about growing plants in uh, lead contaminated soil. I put the URL up here in the chat window and what I read basically corroborates what Cindy just said. These are kind of normal levels of lead. Um, and the article also goes on, talks about the fact that, you know, certain <clears throat> vegetables are going to absorb more lead into the edible part than others. So if you're really worried about it, um, you, you can avoid those or you can wash them or peel them or something like that. So um, have a look at that article. Uh, UC does some great research and a lot of it's online. And I'll, I'll add the link to the University of Massachusetts uh, article as well.
Okay, Maggie, did we have um, anything, any, any questions in the... Um... Yes, we have a number of questions. Um, um, first of all, there's one with regard to spider mites. Um, can spider mites enter uh, the pomegranate? I opened one yesterday and a spider was at the tip of the pomegranate. Mm. Well, one thing about spider mites is they're very tiny. They're like a grain of pepper. If you see a spider, it's just a spider. And uh, the, the little mites are going to want to suck the leaf to get the juice for that. They don't, they don't like pomegranates the way we do. <laughs> so I wouldn't worry about the spider that you saw. It's too big to be a spider mite. Oh, and by the way, if you think you might have spider mites, take a white piece of paper, put it under the leaf or the plant, and give it a, a sharp wrap, the plant. And if you see little pepper, a little dust falling onto the white leaves, look at those. And if they start crawling and moving, then they're spider mites. And they just sit still and it's just ash or, or, or dust. Okay, great. Yeah, and I, I would say, don't worry about a spider on a pomegranate. I, uh, she's not gonna get inside a pomegranate, I think. And spiders on the whole are very good to have uh, in your garden in terms of what they eat. Um, so I, I just w wouldn't worry about it. All right. Uh, we have a question um, about houseplants. Someone wants to know what the best way to get rid of fungus gnats on their houseplants might be. Um, I can take that one. Okay. Um, so fungus gnats, everybody has probably experienced fungus gnats if you uh, have um, wonderful houseplants in, in, in your home. Uh, they're small flies and they're about an eighth of an inch long and they're drawn to moist potting soil and decaying plant material at the base of the indoor plants. Um, they also lay eggs in houseplant soil and the eggs become larvae and feed on the fungi in the soil. They love the organic matter and will eat plants, uh, the plant roots or seedlings. I never knew this before, but they also leave a slime trail across the top of the soil. At one point, I saw that at my daughter's house and I thought that she had a snail inside, but it was, it was actually these fungus gnats. So the best way, um, the, one of the, the, the main ways is to avoid um, overwatering to reduce excess moisture and allow the soil to dry between your waterings uh, and don't let that water accumulate in the saucers. I know that a lot of times I thought that if it accumulated in those saucers, it would just pull it up and it would be watered. But um, um, according to this, we're not supposed to let water accumulate in saucers. Um, another option is some people have used that yellow sticky tape. Um, and it traps the adults and thereby reduces the number of eggs. Um, and uh, they're very noticeable right now around autumn. Um, and they might hitchhack, hitchhike on plants when brought indoors, so check your plants. Also, I have seen them when I was trying to look at houseplants in a, in a, a big box store. And um, they, had, they had all these little uh, flies or fungus gnats uh, flying around. So I definitely didn't buy any of those. <laughs> so another uh, way is just use a sterile potting mix. Always look at your soil when planting or repotting. Uh, does anybody else have any, have any have experiences with fungus gnats? I have some things to add to that. Okay. Um, another thing that you might want to do indoors, it's very easy to solve if you just let your plant dry out and water correctly. And it's very simple. You don't need chemicals or anything. The fungus gnats only last a day or two. The problem is the eggs. They lay eggs in that time in your soil. So um, most people are trying to kill the gnats, but the real problem is the eggs that they're laying. So you might want to scrape about an inch off of your soil, uh, which will take those eggs off the top you know, of the soil and the problem should go away. I'd also like to add um, just a little story. Um, I have fungus gnats outside mm -hmm. where my um, hose bib is, um, where it's wet. I have up flying up about six feet, uh, a continual circle of fungus gnats. And um, I've always kind of found it interesting. 
But then I found that my Hummer was diving through this, uh, eating all these fungus gnats. And I thought, oh, yay, I have something good in my yard. And then um, in the last week or so, I've noticed bats in my garden. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, just at dawn or at sunset and um, flying through these fungus gnats. So there is a, a reason for them to be alive. Um, birds love them. <laughs> Just an extra note for fungus gnats. That's great. Great. All right. Um, while we're on the subject of house plants, we have another one. Um, this person has several cactus plants on a kitchen counter in front of a sunny window. Um, and the plants have white fuzzy stuff on them now. Oh. Um, what is this? What can I do about it? I already had one cactus plant die from this. I also got the same fuzzy stuff on my African violets. Um, I think I can also take that one. I um, have quite a few succulents in windows at my house. And um, what she's describing is mealybugs. And uh, they like to eat the new growth on succulents. And it's difficult to say uh, exactly what causes them to show up. But overwatering and over fertilizing again are common causes. Um, you know, one of the best ways is to take those plants outside immediately and don't uh, let them be around other plants because those mealybugs seem to spread like the plague. Um, and the best solution is um, I spray them off first with water, a, a, just a good hosing down. Uh, if that doesn't work, I use a solution of 70% isopropyl alcohol. And um, a lot of the information online uh, and from UCANR says that um, you should use a Q-tip swab. Well, sometimes they are, you know, they're inside, they grow by the leaf and the stem. They love to, to go down into to the leaf and stem. So I, I dilute the alcohol with water about half and half and I spray it in there and I spray them thoroughly. And as you're spraying, the uh, alcohol on the um, on you know on the plant, you can see that white covering fade away, and there's like little black dots, and you and those are the mites. And um, basically, uh, it, I know that it doesn't hurt the plant. It, the alcohol eventually evaporates, and and there's just water left on the plant. Um, and that's one of the things that, um, that I've, I've done and it's been very successful. I know that uh, there are a couple of other succulent experts here. Maybe you'd like to add something. Well, I agree with you, Cynthia, that taking it outside, if I have an orchid that gets mealy, I take it outside and within a week or two, it's gone. Hmm. Um, because there's lots of critters outside that like to eat mealy bud. But again, you also have the eggs to deal with. So, you can wipe them off your plant because those little bugs, little mealies are very fragile. So it doesn't take much to kill them. You know, a Q-tip will kill them, but you still have the eggs in the bark or, or the moss or whatever. So if you really have a bat in infestation and you put it outside and that doesn't help, then you might want to repot, um, make sure all the eggs are gone. Great. Anybody else have anything to add? Great. All right. All right. Um, we're going to move outside now. Um, so we have several fruit tree questions. One is um, with regard to a peach tree. Um, the question, uh, the description is the, the peach tree had a black powdery substance on the branches that destroyed all the flowers. <clears throat> and um, there have been no leaves growing through the summer. Um, Ooh. On. Um, okay, the picture has just been posted. Okay, great. Um, it looks like it would be like it would in winter with no leaves, and we do not think it is dead because the branches are still flexible. Is there anything that can be done to to make it have it recover from this? It's still a small tree, just two years old, and it was treated with uh, copper sulfate last year. So well, I think, I don't know a lot about fruit trees, but I do know that if a tree is um, suffering, especially a fruit tree, it'll stay dormant. 
I've had a walnut tree that was in too much shade and it did not start putting leaves out until July, until it got enough light. So trees will defend themselves. Uh, Jonathan, you probably have some experience with this. Um, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit stumped. I, I would just be curious to know like where in San Francisco, San Mateo counties, this tree is um, because there are, you know, some parts of our area that are just not very good for growing peaches. Um, so perhaps the person could just, just say that um, either verbal, you know, verbally or in the chat window. San Mateo near Crystal Springs. Hmm. Is it getting light? Is it shaded? Looks like it's getting light. It's and it's against a it's near a fence. I, I, I you know, near Crystal Springs, it's you, you get that cool afternoon wind in, in there, which it's probably not going to like. Mm -hmm. um, it says it gets lots of light. Yeah, it's not warm enough. Peaches like a lot of heat. Yeah, yeah. So if it's not warm enough, the, the tree will stay dormant. It won't um, leave out if it's not got what it needs. Yeah. What, what might I, be the, the black powdery substance? I'm a little stumped on that one. I mean, you know, the main problem that, that peach trees have in, in this area is peach leaf curl. Right, and, and that's just endemic to this area and it affects peaches and of course nectarines. Um, and what happens is the leaves just literally curl up and get, you know, very gnarly and, 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 and the, the, the plant gets very sick, doesn't produce fruit and eventually dies. Um, this so I, I have a question. Like that. I have a question I'm going to throw in. I'm, it sounds to me like maybe um, the person asking the question is the one who originally planted the tree. And one thing that I have um, found to be true with many, many people who've approached me asking gardening questions is that it's a very, very common mistake to plant a new tree too deep in the soil. Mm -hmm. And if the tree is planted too deep, if you make the hole too deep and you set the tree down and then you carefully mound up your beautiful soil a little too high on the trunk of the tree, um, that actually um, can cause the tree to, to not thrive. That, um, and so uh, the, the area right, right where the trunk of the tree widens out and turns into roots, that part of the trunk is very, very sensitive to oxygen and needs a lot of oxygen. And if you have soil mounded up around that part of the trunk, you, you're essentially suffocating the tree. So if that is a contributor, then the effect that would have is it would make the tree overall less healthy and less resistant to whatever insults come its way. And so if there were, you know, uh, powdery mildew or black, what's the, the black version that- Downy mildew. Downy yeah. mildew. Um, it, the tree can't fight anything off because it's struggling because it's dying off because it can't get enough air where it needs it at the bottom. Well, I, I agree that one main problem for die off of trees is they're planted too deeply and that leads to all kinds of rot. But what's confusing to me is this, this powdery stuff on the branches, on the woody part, because your downy mildew, your mildews are generally on the leaves. Yeah. So that's kind of stumping me is well, what would grow on that, on that bark. So I think that maybe a close up of that. Um, and at the end, we're going to show you a link to Helpline. And um, if this peach tree owner could send close-ups of that black powdery stuff with, along with information about planting um, and depth and other cultural stuff, cultivation stuff that you do, 
um, that that would would give them a leg up on helping you solve this problem. Yeah, the, the only thing I would add to that is it would be interesting to know what the leaves look like before they fall off. Yeah. And were there leaves on this tree earlier in the in the spring? Yeah. It could be just a die off, uh, the leaf die off from the um, peach curl or first from something else. Do, what do you guys said they had no leaves. No leaves were growing through the summer. The black stuff apparently destroyed all the flowers and there were no leaves grow no leaf growth through the summer. No leaves. Oh, so that makes me think that if the black stuff destroyed the leaves, then maybe like downy mildew, it started on the leaves and the and it's just residual on the on the branch and stuff now. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe mm -hmm. we could get Shalini's mic on. Mm -hmm. So the other the other thing that I'm noticing um, is um, the growing conditions, it, and I, I would ask questions about the irrigation. Um, in addition to the the planting depth, there may be some. It looks like there's some um, micro sprinklers that might be really close to the to the crown. So just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Hi, yes, this is Shalini. And we, we do have, uh, we water it regularly. So we have a drip system um, at the base of the tree. And uh, we don't think it is planted very deep, but I'll, I'll have to go out and check that. It, it just so happened that, you know, the, uh, as you, you would mentioned before, the leaves did start curling. And, um, you know, we had treated our uh, plum tree with copper sulfate solution and it worked for the plum tree. So we thought it would work for the peach tree as well. So we sprayed the peach tree um, during fall and somehow the leaves never came back. It just, we, at this point, we can't even decide if it's alive or not because the branches are still uh, soft and you know they're hard to break off so our assumption is that it is alive do you have any um do you know what a node is um uh, where the um i i'm looking at your tree and i'm seeing the branch to the right and i'm seeing nodes down the the branch that would yeah. be the raised part um mm -hmm. on on the branch if if that is uh, subtle and um raised your tree is probably still alive. Um, if those are sh shriveled up and gone, then your, plant, your tree is probably in trouble. As long as those nodes are there, it probably will regrow at some point um, with the meristemic fluid is there. It just right now it's in distress. So it's, it's not producing anything. It's protecting itself. It's staying dormant. I'm, I'm wondering, I wanted to ask um, the other experts here. Um, I mean, it's not a big tree, right? It's only two years old, but would there be value in cutting it back um, this winter to, to, to give it a, a, maybe a better chance of, of retrenching and, and regrowing? I think it needs to be cut back because of the shape of the tree. Um, like there's a there's a curled um, branch there that should be cut off, and um, just for the future shape of the tree, I think it should be cut back, and I, I I think it would help the tree personally. I'm also looking at the trunk. It looks like there's a tie to a a woody stake next to it towards the bottom, and it seems as if that's caused some scraping on that trunk. You can see where the bark is scraped off. It looks yellowish, and that could have put in a bacterial infection or something. It wouldn't account for black powdery stuff on the bark, but perhaps the um, you know water getting on it would. Um, but uh, that that looks concerning, if that is yellow from bark being scraped off of that young tree. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, is if if it's still alive, do we need to do anything to help it um, or should we just let it be just keep on do, giving it so we do give it fertilizer uh, whenever we give it to other plants so do we should we keep on doing that or just I, let it be I would recommend that you that you 
cut it cut it back down a little bit as Cindy, as Cindy said and um, use compost rather than fertilizer right now unless you've done a, a, a soil sample you don't know what you're short on in the soil so you might be messing it up by adding stuff into it that it already might have too much of so um, put some compost over it um, and I said inch and a half of compost around it mm -hmm. and uh, and and you can also scrape it very lightly with something sharp to see if it's green underneath the bark and you can do that up at the branch level and you can do it even on the trunk just a light scrape to see if there's green wood under it the green wood says it's alive if there's no green wood then um, that's a problem you can monitor that you can monitor the growth of the of the brown wood if the branch tips are brown but the tree trunk has green then uh, you just you just keep checking to make sure that it's not dying back all the way down your tree. And you never would feed a dormant tree. A tree can't take up nutrients when it's it doesn't, won't take up nutrients when it's dormant. So um, do not feed it until it starts growing leaves again. All right, all right. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for your question. All right, um, another fruit tree question. Um, this is someone who lives in San Francisco um, with an apple tree in the backyard. And the person says that it produces hundreds of apples every year. Um, and, but every year over in the course of one evening, all the apples would be gone and eaten to the stem. Um, there were very few eaten apples left on the ground. Our Yard has high fences. My question is, what animal did that does this every year, and what can I do to prevent it? Rats. This is a uh, the person Most says they. Rats. Okay. I had the same problem with my apple tree this year. I went out one day and there were no apples on it. They were gone, <laughs> and it's either something's eating them or something somebody's stealing them. One or the other. <laughs> So um, I had the same problem with my peach tree this year. It was loaded. My husband was watching it every day. Um, he could hardly wait to get the peaches off of there. Went out the next day and every one of them was gone. There was no sign anywhere on the ground, anything. He was sure yeah. somebody had come in our yard and stolen them. <laughs> my, my apple tree's in the front yard. So yeah. it, it, it could be, but I think someone came and stole them all too. But I've eaten apples. So it probably I, is rodents. You know, um, anecdotal evidence, just what I've heard from people is this was a really bad summer for rats. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it was related to having a drier winter than usual and they were just just desperate, but it was a bad summer for rats. And it, it, at least down here in Menlo Park, it was a really bad summer for squirrels. Um, in my case, it's the squirrels. Um, who, who go after the apple tree and you know the fence tops are like freeways for the squirrels so if you have a tree that's close to a fence they're just going to run down that fence and and jump onto your tree from there and um, so I, I try to bird net um, my fruit trees where I can um, it's the only way that I can keep the squirrels out. I imagine it would keep rats out as, as well. Um, I, I just want to toss this out to people because I, I read this somewhere that one of the things you can do to keep the rats away, obviously if it is rats, you want a rat trap around the bottom of the tree, um, is if you have like a, a, a light source out there at night, the rats aren't going to like that and they're going to stay away. So like if you get one of these solar powered uh, yard lights um, that it, you know, that just is lit up at night, that that can help keep the rats away. Any, any thoughts from other people? You can also get those lights that have a motion activated. And so they'll, so they, and they're very sensitive um, and they'll come on right away, which is startling to the animals. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I have seen, I haven't tried it myself, um, are I've, there's an old orchard near where I live that has sort of like metal collars that are on the trunks of the fruit trees. 
-hmm. and they're they're large enough so that the animal would not be able to you know get up and up and around them um it's almost like the what you might see on a ship on the on a rope that that keeps the animal from from continuing on um, you could try that around the trunk of the tree as well as perhaps some kind of barriers along the top of the fence. Perhaps once the apples are harvested, you could then remove them. Um, but any kind of physical barrier like that might be a possibility. I, try, I tried Tanglefoot this year, with, again, for squirrels, not rats. Um, Tanglefoot is a, is a gooey substance and you, you apply it not to the trunk of the tree itself, but you sort of wrap um, this paper-like substance around the trunk and you, you spread the tangle foot on that. Um, and, it, and again, it prevents critters from crawling up the trunk. Um, it's kind of messy to work with. It's really sticky. So I'm not sure I'd recommend it. And the squirrels just laughed at it, honestly. Yeah. They, just, they just leapt around it. Yeah. A rat would have more trouble getting getting around Tanglefoot. But I think Maggie's suggestion of the metal collar is is much better. I, I, I see that um, quite commonly. Yeah, they use a lot another, of thing, another thing, when you talked about emotion-activated uh, light, it reminded me, some of the other master gardeners might remember this, but a number of years ago, all my my beans were disappearing from my pole beans, and I had no idea what was eating them, um, and, and it seemed to be happening at night, so I bought, a friend had a critter cam, which mm -hmm. is a motion-activated camera, and I put it out there, and I trained it on the pole beans, and I got a photo of these two little beady red eyes. <laughs> um, and I sent that out to the master gardeners and everyone said, oh, you got rats. So you could try a critter cam um, to, and, and that'll tell you, have you got rats or, you know, squirrels are going to be more daytime, you know, early in the morning, uh, late in the day, whereas rats are nocturnal, they're going to be nighttime. All right. Okay, um, we have another apple apple question from someone else this time. Um, <clears throat> so someone who has a green apple tree that um, the apples are not so sweet um, and it has never yielded good fruit. All the apples we get have some rusty spots. What could be going wrong? Are, are they leaving the apples on the tree long enough? Don't know exactly what I was thinking you know unlike you know your your stone fruits which will continue to ripen once once you pick them apples don't do that and, and persimmons don't do that right so if you pick it too early it's going to be pretty tart the other thing I was thinking is you know some varieties of green apples are pretty tart <laughs> Um, so it, yeah. it, it might just be the variety that you have. <clears throat> what about the rusty spot? It says rusty spot. Probably rust. <laughs> or perhaps that, that could be a varietal thing too, like a pippin will have kind of a rough brownish yeah. quality to it. Maybe that's... Rust that's is on the leaves or the apple? It says the apples have a rusty spot. It does not say fruit or leaf? I, you know, I, 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 apples get all sorts of minor discolorations, which I find really, you know, don't matter much at all. Um, so, it, you know, unless something's really hurting the fruit, I, 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 I'm not sure it's a, it's a huge problem. Okay. It's more um, cosmetic than uh, okay. you know, serious. Okay. Actually, the, the person the person quote posing the question just sent in a little bit more information. The fruit has the the rusty patches are inside. Mm. Oh. Mm. Rust. It wouldn't be rust inside the apple. Yeah. Perhaps perhaps that means a brownish a brownish coloration. That sounds like a little pest, little pest damage. Something got in there and, and was oh, probably the, a moth, uh, moth yeah. larva. 
Yeah. Not the, yeah, not the coddling moth though. My apples, when they're there, all, a lot of them have uh, damage from moth larva. Yeah, yeah, and me too. It, it. <laughs> it, it happens all the time and you just, you just cut that part out. That's what I do. <clears throat> I'm wondering if they don't say if they thin the fruit um, at all um, um, or other, other practices, it would be good to know that. I, I would agree. I mean, it, you know, again, it, it, the person said hundreds of apples. Um, no, it didn't say that. It just says, um, oh, read apple right. tree that is not sweet. It has never yielded good fruit. Oh, All yeah, the apples no, we get are musty. Before. The hundreds that there, we've got two apple tree questions in a right. row. The second I mean, one does not refer to the quantity of fruit. But it's it's a good point about thinning apples. Yeah, apples have a tendency to to grow in in clusters of three, and um, that can be a little bit too much. So mm -hmm. y it helps to to thin those clusters of three to to one, or a, the professional people probably thin them to one to get bigger fruit. I'm greedy, so I I thin it to two. A okay. little bit more info here. Um, the fruit has a rust patch inside. It has a speck or a black dot and patchy brown inside. Yeah, and, then, and then the second point is that about 40 to 50 apples come from a huge old tree and it has never been thinned. They, they, fruits are not thinned. Are, are not what? They have, they have not thinned the fruit um, during gr growing, and they're, they the yield is about 40 to 50 from a, a, a huge old tree. Um, so I would, I would say, first of all, that's a pretty low yield from a, a, a big apple tree. I mean, I, I have a reasonably small apple tree, and I got 100 apples this year. So, it, you know, it, it may just be nearing the end of its life. Um, apple trees don't live forever. Um, so if, if the, the fruit volume is low, it just may be getting kind of old. Um, I'm just going to throw in also that it might, you might get some useful info if you take some photos of those brown spots in your fruit and send them into the helpline. Um, and then master gardeners can do a little bit of research based on those photos when I just do a quick search on my phone as I'm listening in, it, it looks to me like there are also some nutritional issues for the tree that can contribute to apples having brown spots on the insides of them. And particularly if it's a very old tree, um, it's possible that, as Jonathan says, it's aging out. It's also possible that it's it doesn't have all the nutrition that it needs. It's not, doesn't have everything in the soil that would cause it to produce optimal fruit. Um, and so, but it, 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 that's something that, for instance, for me, I would, I would want a picture and then I would want an hour or two at home with my computer doing research before I gave you a real answer. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. So more detail to the helpline. Great, all right. Switching from apples to marigolds, um, this person has uh, posted a, an image. Um, so I'll ask Jeffrey to, to do that. Um, and the, what is posed is that my marigolds have tiny pathways through their leaves. Should anything be done? Mm. Let's see the picture, Jeffrey. Okay. Pathways. And uh, I see on, on about the third leaf on the right side of the picture, the third leaf down, yeah. Um, it looks like that's a little trail that might be a leaf miner. Typically what you see is a winding little pathway for a leaf miner. Those other um, spots look more like spots than little pathways. Uh, but the fact that it's not a long pathway would indicate that uh, what I think that might be would be a leaf miner. 
they go kind of mine the leaves. The the um, adult lays an egg, so so that it just is just inside between the top and the bottom of the leaf, and then the larvae come and they sort of eat their way around, and they make these little trailing white paths as they consume the the green um, part of the of the leaf, and then um, they'll drop to the ground and and continue their life cycle from there. So typically, what you do is you remove the infested leaf. Uh, but there are there are predators for it. There's no way you can control it uh, or try to control it with pesticide because they're inside the leaf. If the, those other little spots might be from your typical um, leaf suckers, like the white flies or the spider mites. White flies are pretty common. If you shake the marigolds, often you can see things sort of flying away. And the, you might see if there are white flies or something else. And again, um, the first line of defense against those types of pests is to um, give it a good jet of water. Um, so does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Well, I think um, as the season turns more fallish um, the, and the temperatures change and there's not as much sunlight during the day, the plant becomes weaker. And I think is more susceptible to um, insects and, you know, other damage that happens to it. It's just uh, part of the seasonal change. Okay, so it doesn't look like a serious infestation now, but remove remove the leaves, give it a spray of water, check to see if there's other insects that come flying away from it and clear up the leaf litter down below the plant uh, in case any of the larvae have already dropped into the leaf litter below the marigold. Okay. All right. Um, we have another houseplant question. Um, flowering houseplants like peace lily and anthurium never bloom. Um, this is the person's experience here. It has, it just has green leaves. I put plant fertilizer once a month. How can I make them bloom? It needs more light. Um, the same thing with orchids or, or anything else that you grow in the house. If you don't have the, if the light requirement isn't met, the plant will not bloom. Um, I think when people buy plants, they think, oh, you know, I love a ficus in that corner over there. It just look great. Well, there's no light in that corner and um, um, you're gonna probably overwater it because it's not using a lot of energy, so it's gonna drown. So, you know, success is, uh, is uh, not always forthcoming. Um, so I would, I would say probably it's light. Um, if they moved into a little more light, they probably would have better luck. I, and I totally agree with, um, with Cindy. Uh, we always say right plant, right place. Um, or, yes. And so um, I, I've had spath lilies, and I know that they do our, our spathophyllum, which is a piece of, a piece lily is a spathophyllum. And uh, I know that it, the recommendation is indirect sunlight, but... Um, when I put mine closer to the windows, uh, they definitely started flowering. And, and I know that they can bloom a couple of times a year, but they don't have a, a blooming season. So, uh, because they're indoors. So a little more information has come in from the person who's asking the question. Um, and it, the location of the plant is right under a skylight. Hmm. 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 You know, um, maybe what the person should do is take that plant out of the container that it's in and, and look at its roots. Um, the roots can tell a lot about the plant's health. If it has a really good root system, there's no reason that plant shouldn't bloom. Um, but if the plant, if the root system is, uh, you know, a lot of dead roots and stuff, that might be the problem. Um, fertilizing um, doesn't always do the trick. People try that with orchids. They just continually fertilize thinking that'll make it bloom, but that's not what'll make it bloom. Maybe it has too much light and it's, um, who knows? It's rebelling or something. <laughs> so 
I don't know. That's a, um, if it's under a, what, what time of the day is the light over the skylight? <laughs> and if it's like my skylight, there's not a lot of light that gets through it. I need well, to mine is under the skylight it. and it never blooms. So, um, cause it's afternoon and it's only for a month out of the year that I get light through the skylight, you know, direct light. So maybe she can tell us what time of the day the light is coming brightly through the skylight. That might help. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Hopefully that will, we'll be able to answer that question. Hi, I was the one who asked the question. Great. It's a conversation fit and I get the sunlight throughout the day from morning till sunset. From sunrise to sunset, I get the light right under the skylight. It's a conversation area where I get the light. Is this the flower? No, that's a salon. Yeah, this is a, is this the my flower? anthurium has really? never bloomed. When I bought it in the store, it was having the bloom for the first time. From then on, I don't have any bloom. That's not a, that's not a spathophyllum. Yeah, so I think that's just her screen image. Oh, oh, okay. I was going to say we were talking something else. Oh, no, no, that's a different image. That's a different image. <laughs> so it's under your skylight all day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But does the sun come in directly into the skylight? No. Uh, no, I get only indirect sunlight. I have one at home that's under a skylight, and it never mm -hmm. blooms because I never get direct light through the skylight. It's just diffused light. It's not enough light. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Even though there is a skylight, if direct sun is not coming through the skylight, then the plant will not get enough light to bloom. Oh, okay. I, I would try moving it to a sunnier spot. Yeah. Just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, at the moment, we are we are out of questions from the audience. Oh, excuse me. We have here <clears throat> um, another question. Do the ashes falling from the sky um, need to be washed off plants? Um, so there's been a lot of discussion among the master gardeners <laughs> about this for the past few weeks and there was some guidance from uh, UC Davis and um, it you know it, so it's it's not dangerous at all um, and my feeling is it can't hurt to to wash it off I mean um, typically when I pull stuff out of, out of my vegetable beds. I don't wash it at all because I haven't used any sprays or chemicals on it. This year I have. So it, it, it just can't hurt. Yes, I would say that um, the ash falling on top of the leaf probably does the plant no harm. The stomatas under the plant, under the leaf, if they get clogged up, then that could harm the plant. But the ash is not going underneath the leaf. So I think it would be fine just to wash it off, too. Yep. And something I was reading was saying that, um, you know, with the hot weather we've had, the hot, sunny, dry weather and the fires, that the haze in the air has actually probably helped the plants by cooling them just a tad, sheltering them from the hot sun. Um, that all the carbon in the air is actually good for the plants. They like carbon, they could care less about the oxygen. It's their oxygen is plant poo. Um, and then the wood ash that falls is, is, is beneficial in the soil. I mean, I know there's bad things in addition to the wood ash, but wood ash itself, washing it off and adding it to the soil, that's probably a good thing too. So mm -hmm. our plants are probably weathering this um, better than than us are. <laughs> yeah. so the uh another question is um um should we prepare plants for heat waves good question um, um I, it, 
Go I ahead. find it hard to prepare plants like my hydrangeas that are in the ground, unless I cover them with something because they burn in a heat wave. Um, but I guess you could cover them. There's that shade cloth you can get. And I did, I've done that before. I just put up some big stakes or something and, and tie it and just drape a little shade cloth. It's black cloth, but it has big um, netting. The netting is, is wide and it's very lightweight. And you would just sort of drape it over a plant. It cuts the sun a little bit. Well, quite a bit actually. And then um, you, can, you can remove that. And definitely uh, before the heat wave you expected or before even a cold wave, you want to make sure that the, um, you've made the, the ground moist so it has plenty of, of water. It's not going to get um, parched. Yeah, that, I, I, I agree with Susan. I mean, shade, you, you, can, you can look into shade cloth, which is, does exactly what it sounds like. And the other thing is pay attention to watering because when it's really hot and dry and the humidity has been getting down in the teens and 20s um, and stuff, you, 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 your plants are going to feel it and you just need to up the watering a little bit. I understand that um, I'd, I'd be interested because the heat waves have been really pretty severe in, in, in my area um, that that comp, you know, adding plenty of compost, making sure your soil is really um, well, well uh, amended um, and working really well can help plants be more resilient as well. How do you feel about that? Well, that's, we, that's and great. We, and mulch. Mulch, yeah. We, we forgot to mention mulch. Yeah, mulch. Um, mulch, mulch, uh, mulch keeps keeps the roots a little cooler and it also prevents the moisture from evaporating. So mulch is really useful. Yeah. Yeah. And the compost you mentioned is good too, because when the microbes from the, from the compost get into the soil, that attracts some of your megafauna down there, like, like earthworms. And when they start making their little pathways, their little tunnels through the soil, that allows space for the water to go in and be held in the earth. That increases the moisture content of your soil. So, you know, protect the surface of it with your mulch, have the compost under that, and don't dig around there. Just let the microbes and the worms and the other megafauna create those pores and those, those tunnels to keep the, the water in. So that's just something that should just be ongoing so that when the heat waves come, your plant is already somewhat prepared. Great. <clears throat> so, um... Right now, we don't have any questions in the in the queue. Um, so perhaps, uh, Susan, you can talk a little bit more about the helpline and getting more information for people who still have maybe or going to have questions uh, until the next time we do this. Um, so and, and also maybe talking a little bit about what we can do to prepare not only for heat waves, but also for the coming, please, 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 colder weather. <laughs> yes, I guess I should say first thing that um, our California native plants are, you know, have evolved here. They're dormant in the summer. And if we know one thing about pruning, we know we pr prune when it's dormant. So we prune our fruit trees, you know, at the, in, in the winter. But our California natives, we prune about this time of year. You know, we prune when it's dormant. That gets them ready for their early winter um, bloom and preparation. So if you have natives, um, you know, prune them now. Some of them can be sheared back. Some of them just tip pruned. Um, I can put up a, I can put up a link that gives information about that. Uh, but then in the meantime, vis-a-vis -vis the helpline, uh, our helpline is staffed by master gardeners and it is there to help um, uh, uh, public gardeners, private gardeners, not the commercial, um, but the homeowner or home renters, gardeners. So you can call and you can send in information. The most helpful way and the quickest way to get your problem solved is to have pictures and to have detailed information. You might wanna talk about uh, where, where you are, uh, what's the orientation of your plant? Is it on the east side, the south side? How many hours of sun does it get? What type of watering? Is it overhead? Is it drip or soaker hose type? And how much water? Um, please talk about what you notice. If you see a problem with leaves, is it all the leaves or just a leaf in one branch? Or is it just an occasional leaf here and there? 
if you see stuff oozing out of the out of the trunk or the bark is it just one spot or do you see it throughout uh, and just remember you you can have a problem with light what comes from the air you can have a problem from the soil what's underneath which you can't see and i'd say that many many problems are under the soil and we can only determine that by looking at the signs on the leaves. And the other part is how we treat the plant. What do we feed it? How do we prune it? Um, do, we, do we accidentally get herbicide on it? All those other factors. So keep those in mind as you look for your plant and then uh, provide that information to Helpline. And um, I think we have a pretty good success rate with helping our home gardeners at Helpline. So that's the information there. Email questions to that, um, that that email address you have there. And you can also give them a call. They're open, um, I think on various days. So someone should be able to get back to you that day or within a couple of days. Any other comments on that? Well, I have a comment about the helpline um, because I, I really learn a lot. And in, I'm a first year master gardener. And every time um, I, do a, a helpline session, I always, I always learn a whole lot. So I really appreciate it from that standpoint and also helping people to solve their problems. Oh, I should say one more thing too. What, what resources do master gardeners use? Um, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna show a, a, show a few. Um, one for, for vegetable gardening, we have this. Is that coming in backwards? No, no, oh, it's good. straight it on. Backwards to me. So this is a wonderful resource. We call it the, the, you know, the gardener's Bible. That's really an excellent one. Uh, and UC Davis has published some really wonderful ones. This is one that everybody in Helpline uses. I refer to it all the time. Pests of Landscape Trees and Shrubs. It has wonderful tables in the back. So you can look up the name of your tree or your shrub. It will give you a list of symptoms. And then it will tell you this likely problem and then it will give you the page number to look it up. Very important resource. A very similar one is called Pests of the Garden and Small Farm. So it's more focused on edibles. And then one that's no longer in print that you can still get it is called Western Gardener Problem Solver. And this, this is um, really easy and wonderful. It's full of pictures. You have, you have a, a, a section on weeds you have a section on pests, you have a section on other problems, you have a section on, you know, what could be wrong based on these symptoms. So those are um, really important and very, very useful resources for anybody who loves gardening and has their own garden. All right, what should we all be doing besides pruning um, or our uh, California natives are getting ready to prune our California natives for the uh, coming fall. Um, I'll just jump jump in. Um, so, uh, in terms of vegetables, um, this is the time to plant a cover crop. Um, like. I would say this week <laughs> would be the time to plant a cover crop, particularly if it's going to rain next weekend, which is wonderful. So, um, if you if you it's a way to put nutrients back into your soil. Um, a good cover crop is fava beans and crimson clover interspersed. Um, plant it now; it'll grow through the winter. Then cut it back before the beans form in the spring. Um, and compost all that stuff and 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 you're good to go so um, this is this is the time of year to do that you can't wait much longer um, to do that um, that means that you're gonna pull out your your warm weather crops at, at this point like like your tomatoes and and all that sort of stuff um, in terms of the fruit trees nothing really to do um, right now, um, if it starts to rain, then you're good. If it doesn't rain for the next few weeks, you want to make sure you still get water to them. Um, the fruit trees, you're not going to prune until basically uh, December, January. Jonathan, I have a question about um, grow bags. Um, I, 
I, since we don't have enough heat here in El Granada, I mm. grow a lot of my veggies in, in these little greenhouses and they're in 30, um, 30 gallon grow bags. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you recommend also um, putting in uh, cover crops in those grow bags. I've never done it before. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, do, do, does it, do you, um, do you just, how big are the bags and, and do you re replace the soil in the bags or you use uh, the You know soil? what I usually do is I put, I, the, the past three years I've been putting, um, that distal compost, um, on the top and, you know, mm -hmm. I water it a couple of times, uh, during the winter and actually some of those shishito peppers and other peppers kind of come up since they're biennial the, the next year. Mm -hmm. uh, I take everything out of the tomato bags, but even their seeds in there and sometimes they grow up mm -hmm. back in and, and they're very large grow bags. So I've had good, you know, I, but I've always wondered if I should do cover crops in my greenhouse during the winter. I would think that just using compost in there would be I, I satisfactory. Agree. I agree, I think, you, I think you're doing fine. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. That's good to know. And, and speaking of compost, I think this is this is also the time when you go out and you get your compost and your mulch. You know, put down an inch of compost and put, um, you know, a, at least a couple inches of mulch over it. Uh, you know, really, you two, three, four inches of, of yeah. mulch. And the best mulch is wood chips and arborist mulch. Um, the the wood, um, the bark wood is made to repel water and keep things away. And you want to invite water and microbes into your soil. So wood chips will be doing that. They'll be feeding your soil. Um, and yeah, oh, the, the other, the, another thing I would say is um, I actually um, replaced the soil in, in some of my veggie beds last winter. Um, so um, I, I actually dug it all, dug out all the old soil at this time of year, um, and then over the winter I I got new soil and, and put it in there. And um, one of the things that happened particularly this year was that when the spring comes, everybody just runs out and wants to get compost and soil, and and they kind of ran out at Lingso. So you know, fall is a great time. To, to go out and, and get compost if you need it, apply it to your vegetable beds. Um, and then the rain hopefully comes in and it filters into the soil and stuff. So I, I definitely do the composting now. Okay, well, it, it seems like we're winding down. I would like to um, ask our attendees to leave a comment about what, um, what you liked and what didn't work so well today. This is our very first uh, remote plant clinic and uh, we'd like to get your feedback on it because uh, it might be that we continue to do this. It seems like it's the, it's the way to go for the meantime. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Susan.